nothing, nothing in the trials we've walked through prepared us for what happened on uh, May 12th, 2002. May 12th, 2002 was, uh, was Mother's Day. And I suppose it's a, a little impactful to me now because we just passed up May 12th. And so this time of year, the sights and the sounds and the smells are the same. But uh, what happened on this Mother's Day, we were planning on, on celebrating Mother's Day, of course, on that Sunday afternoon. And Colleen worked in the afternoon. Well, what Colleen did, she was 17 at the time. So Colleen and I, we went to Target store the night before. And so her and I bought a bunch of Mother's Day presents. And so we get them all and, we, and, and, so we, and they're wrapped and they're at the house. And so Colleen's at work that day. So I go to pick her up at work. She's working in this restaurant. So as I go to pick her up, uh, Janine, my wife, she's on her way to the restaurant to meet us because the three of us then are going to go home, celebrate Mother's Day. The boys are at home with all the wrapped presents. So as uh, Janine shows up and now Colleen and I were finished with our ice cream sundae, we go up to the cash register and I'm paying. And as I, I pay and Colleen and I are just standing there talking, she looks at me and she says, Dad, I feel dizzy. And she collapsed into my arms and I caught her. And at that moment, she instantly died in my arms. Now, I, I didn't know she was dead. I thought she just fainted. I, I eased her down to the ground and I checked her pulse. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. There's no pulse. Somebody called 911 and, and I started CPR on her right away. And the paramedics got there very quickly and, and they were doing CPR and they loaded her up in the ambulance and the hospital was just a mile down the road. And so they get down to the hospital and my wife and I are following them to the hospital and they're frantically trying to get her heart started again. And we're, we're in the hospital and it's, it's like one of those scenes in a movie. Seriously, they are, she's on the gurney and they're, they're sprinting down the hall, pushing her, busting open doors as they're you know, pounding on her chest and, and, and sticking tubes down her throat. And we're jogging behind all the doctors as they're, we're running down the, you know, running down the hall. So we, we get into the room and they, they, remarkably, they let us in the room where they were working on her. So we get in there and just everybody's flooding in there and there's a team of probably about 10 doctors and nurses all just frantically working on her. And they've got the electric paddles and they're, you know, you know shocking as her body's bouncing off the table. And so, and, and my wife and I are just standing here watching her body bouncing off the table and, and I'm just, I'm praying. I'm like, Lord, you've got to be kidding me. What is going on here? How can this be? We were just having an ice cream sundae. What's happening here? And I'm praying like you can't even imagine. I, and I'm making every deal I can with the Lord. I'm like, God, I'll, I'll do anything. You know, I'm like, I'll do anything. I, I'll, and I, I'm, I'm bargaining with the Lord. I, I'm like, you know, think about it. God, I'll have these doctors on my show. I'll have them in the studio with me. And they'll attest to the fact that this is a miracle. And, and think about the people we can bring to you, Lord, through this. And that's every sales pitch I can come up with. Uh, but what's happening is we're watching, and it's been 20 minutes. Now it's been 40 minutes. And, there's, and now I notice, and they keep increasing the electricity, and her body's not bouncing off the table anymore. It's just, and then they increase it, and her, just, her body's not flinching anymore even. And now it's been just about an hour that they've been working on her, and they're still just frantically, the electric shock and the pounding her chest, and the electric shock and the pounding her chest, and the head doctor who's in charge of all of them, he's like the, the chief of their, their heart department or whatever. Uh, he was on the other side of the table, but you know, like his, he was facing me, but looking down, working as the other team was there. And as my wife and I are sta standing there, I, boy, I so vividly remember, he's looking down and then he, he looked up at me, you know, and I knew what that meant. And so I waved him over. And so the rest of the team kept working on her, and he walked over to me. And, uh, and I said to him, listen, I know it's probably difficult for you to give up when the parents are standing right here watching you. But I got to tell you, the truth is that my daughter's been with Jesus for the last hour. You're grabbing at her ankles, and she ain't coming back. So... If you want to give up, it's okay. I'm not going to fault you. I know you did your best. So this, uh, this doctor, he, tears welled up in his eyes. And he leaned forward because he didn't want his assistants hearing this. But uh, he said, 
you know what, I have a daughter of my own. He said, and this is killing me. And I want to give your little girl back to you so bad. Uh, you know, and he said, I'm really sorry. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I don't know why I can't get her heart started again. I just, I don't understand. And I said, it's all right. I said, I'm not going to blame you. I know you tried your hardest. I watched you. And he said, okay. So we hugged each other. He, uh, he got his composure. He wiped his eyes. He turned around. And he very authoritatively said, mark the time of death. And those are the words. And at that point, everybody just stopped. They pulled all the tubes out of her mouth. They wrapped up the electric paddles. They were all out of the room in probably 30 seconds. And then there's just three of us left in the room, myself, my wife, and Colleen. And boy, I'll tell you, you know, I, I tell this story, I tell this story, and it's okay, but I guess this close to May 12th, maybe it's a little more difficult than I anticipated telling, but so just, you know, pardon me. But, uh, but anyway, I, I walk up to her, and I remember, folks, I didn't know what to do. I just, I did not know what to do. I, I remember I, I had a fist, because honestly, what I wanted to do is just go on a rampage and start busting stuff up. But I did, I guess, what any dad would do. I leaned over, and I... I scooped her up, I hugged her, I squeezed her, and I just cried like a baby. <laughs> so I just cry, and then I, I, I put her head back down, I kissed her on her cheek, I whispered goodbye in her ear. And, uh, and I said to my wife, listen, I said, I got to get out to the waiting room, because by now, the waiting room had started filling up with a whole bunch of people that heard that Colleen had fainted and was taken to the hospital. No one had any idea what happened. And so I was like, I got to go out to the waiting room, tell everybody what's happened. So as I leave the room, I look back, and I notice my wife walks up to Colleen's body. And as I, as I am getting to the door, I look back, because I just see she closed her eyes, she raised her hand, and she quoted out of Job. She whispered, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And so I, uh, I get out into the waiting room, and uh, I, everybody's like, hey, so how's Colleen? Can we go see her now? And I said, listen, I can't believe I'm going to utter these words, but Colleen just died. And they're wailing and they're crying and they're going, God, no, how could, you know, whatever. And, you know, and I'll tell you, I've seen so many people walk away from the Lord when something bad happens. And I just, I couldn't stand the idea of that happening. And I remember, I just, I told everybody to shut up. I was like, shut up, be quiet. I've got to say something. I have to get this off my chest. And everybody got quiet for a moment. And I said, listen, Jesus Christ was Lord yesterday. He's still Lord today. Can we all agree on that? And they were like, yes. And I said, okay, then let's figure out how to get through this. So anyway, so I go back in the room and I, I get my wife and, uh, and I said, you know what? We have to get home. We have to get home right now because the boys are at home and I don't want them finding out through the grapevine. So we hurried up. We got in the car and we drove home. We left Colleen there and, and we, we walk in the front door and the boys are like, where's Colleen? You know, because we got the pile of Mother's Day presents. So I said, come here, guys. And I had to sit them down around the couch and tell them what happened to their older sister. Heartbreaking. Now, I'm not going to kid you. This was really tough. <laughs> it was really tough. And I, you know, and yes, I sit there and I go, all Janine did when I was 23 years old was go, Jesus, will you heal his heart? And he did it. God, you're willing to send bird crap on my windshield, but you won't give me back my daughter? You see, folks, what we need to do as Christians is I think we need to have some gut check time. I think we need to ask ourselves, why do I serve God? Why do I worship Him? Do I worship Him because of how He performs? Do I worship him because he always makes sense to me? Do I worship him because he gives me what I want and because he makes sense to me every day? Or do I worship him because he is God? I submit to you, we need to make a decision to worship God for who he is. 
and to trust in his sovereignty, even when it doesn't make sense to us. I don't know why these kind of things happen. I mean, we could talk about a fallen world and free will and the consequences of sin, and I, mean, I understand all that, okay? But the simple fact is this. We make a conscious decision to worship God in good times and bad. This is a conscious decision. We don't always feel like doing it. Anyone can say, praise the Lord, the day they get a raise. Will we say praise the Lord on the day we get fired? Because we're not going to feel like saying praise the Lord. When you say praise the Lord on the day you get a raise, all that is is an expression of your emotion. When you say praise the Lord on the day you get fired, that's not an expression of emotion. That's an expression of decision. I know a lot of you right now have your own issues that you're dealing with, that you're battling with. And maybe you're grappling with why God, why? I don't understand. This isn't fair. Can I encourage you this morning? Take what you're going through. Take your struggles. Take your battles. Take your frustrations. Take your anger with God. And let Him know, you are God and I worship you and I serve you. Not because you meet my expectations, <laughs> but because you are God. You see, I don't, I, I'm very thankful that God doesn't make me earn my place as his child. Why are we trying to make him earn his place as our heavenly father? Not to mention the fact he knows what he's doing way more than I do, way more than I do. I trust in him. I trust in his sovereignty. And that's got to be good enough for me. You know something? I'll finish with this. Because we're going to have a little time of prayer afterward. Uh, think about your own child. You take your own child to Disneyland, and at Disneyland they say, you're a great mom, you're a great dad, I really love you. That's nice, but they're saying that with cotton candy on their chin, right? <laughs> but what about on the day that you deny your child something that was really, really important to them? You're not letting them have what they want, and this, it's like their whole world is collapsing, and you said no. What if your child, how much would it bless you on that day, if your child, through their tears, said, I don't understand this, this is such a big deal to me, how can you say no? I'm really upset with you, but you are my mom, you are my dad, and I love you, and that will never change. How much would it bless you to hear that from your child at that moment? How much do you think it blesses our Heavenly Father when you say to Him, right now, God, I don't understand you, this isn't fair, this doesn't make sense to me, how can you do this, how can you allow this? But you are my heavenly father, and that will never change. I love you. How much do you think it blesses him to hear us praise him in the midst of our pain? That's what I want to encourage you to do. Offer what you're going through as a sacrifice to him to show him, God, I love you not for what you do for me, but because of who you are. And the simple fact is giving us Jesus Christ is enough. It is enough. Not to mention the fact a hundred years from now, can we all be honest? A hundred years from now, who cares? Really, take the worst thing you're going through right now. A hundred years from now, who cares? Aren't we all going to be in heaven? Seriously, a hundred years from now, laughing at how seriously we took these big things in our life when we were walking on the earth here. And we're going to be going, wow, how little I knew then and how much it makes sense now. And how serious I thought it was then. That is, is the conversation we're going to be having. So how do I view my daughter's death right now? Yes, it's painful. When I recount the images of her body laying there, yes, I, I struggle getting through it. But ultimately, I know this simple fact. She merely beat me to the party. And I'm okay with that. 